there's a lot that goes into these worship services and uh, people bring their expertise and really bless us don't they it's uh, uplifting and it's something that is important that we come and we praise the Lord and worship the Lord I wanted to tell you a, a thing or two um, this weekend Scott and Kathleen Hartlitz are in Virginia in Washington DC because Scott's son is becoming a general in the Air Force isn't that amazing it's just wonderful and the Lord has helped them get there and and they texted me just a couple of days ago and said it is the Lord that has made this happen for them to be able to travel there without any problems and he's just done beautifully and so we're just so pleased to celebrate that with him and so I hope that you will pray for each other continue to pray for each other no matter what happens no matter what illness we have no matter how difficult things may seem the Lord is good and the Lord loves us and helps us now all throughout the period of time before Jesus was born for years Israel anticipated a Savior who would come to them and so they were waiting for that Savior they talked about waiting for that Savior they were looking for him we could do the same and looking for him to come again but it was very real to them for example at the time of John the Baptist Luke tells us this everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah and remember they went and even asked him and he said nope it's not me not me and later John was in prison he was convinced that it was Jesus he had baptized him and and um, so he was out there taking a lot of flack because of Jesus and so then it landed him in prison and he was really discouraged when he was in prison and so he sent a message to Jesus whom he believed in but he was so discouraged he said Jesus are you the Messiah we've been expecting and of course Jesus then sent a word of encouragement back to him now crowds were amazed at his healing at his teaching they followed him and they began asking among themselves could it be that Jesus is the son of David the Messiah and there was a lot of excitement as that began to unfold now here's an interesting one and this happened when Jesus was only a week old and Jesus was uh, a baby and his parents were taking him into the temple and at that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon he was righteous and devout and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah isn't that interesting to be defined that way because he wanted the Messiah to come and rescue Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him and the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah and that very day Jesus parents brought him into the temple and as a baby he knew he knew what a gift God's people were looking for the Messiah and the Holy Spirit is the revealer of the Messiah so today is Pentecost and when the Holy Spirit came that day all those many years ago and probably around 34 AD it was 50 days after Easter and the Holy Spirit filled the disciples with this heavenly power the Holy Spirit came upon them and and so that they could see that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and so that is the connecting point from fearful disciples in the upper room and very bold disciples going out and talking and proclaiming to the surrounding world all about Jesus faith isn't very powerful if it doesn't hold fast in these hard times they were together praying it was a hard time they didn't know yet about the Lord and then 
the Holy Spirit came and empowered them, and they would have trouble. But it would be victorious, victorious. Because look at today. Look at today. Jesus is known all over the world. Now Luke 4 says this. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, the first thing, when he was led out into the wilderness, it was the Holy Spirit that led him out there. And then, when he came back into town, the first place he went was his hometown, Nazareth. And that's where he preached his first sermon. And the sermon he preached was the scripture we read from Isaiah, Isaiah 61. I hope we listen to it. And you know what it's said said the and he's reading it and he told the people the spirit of the lord is upon me the spirit of the lord is upon me he's appointed me to preach good news to the poor to bind up the brokenhearted my job is to proclaim freedom for captives i'm going to recover light for the blind I'm going to comfort all who grieve. That's Jesus' job through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Because we all experience ashes, right? We all have those troubles and those struggles. We all have those periods of grieving that things, bad things happen. We all have brokenheartedness. We all have a need for good news. And so that's what Jesus does through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Lord of happy endings. Can we say that together? Jesus is Lord of happy endings. Okay. Now, we're going to try that one more time like you know it's happy news. We are Lord of happy endings. One more time. Lord. We, Jesus is Lord of happy endings. Yay. All these things are the work of the Holy Spirit. All of them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And we need to get that in our heads because we're celebrating that today. We're celebrating. If you don't feel strong spiritually, guess who you have? The? The Holy Spirit. That's what I have. It's great news. It's great news. The Holy Spirit blesses you. So Jesus started his ministry with the Holy Spirit. He had to have the Holy Spirit to be filled with the power of God. He began to talk to his own people who were seeking the Messiah. That's where he started. He did this because his Father loves the world, all of the world. That is what Jesus' motive for doing what he did was. Because he's like God. He is God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he takes delight in loving you. Do you ever marvel at that? I certainly do. That is hard for me to understand. He really loves me. He seeks us despite our incongruent habits are habits that don't reflect him at all. He loves us. He, he seeks us out. Remember last week we talked about how he seeks the one out of the 99? If one wanders off, he seeks the wandering off ones. He doesn't wait till you get your act together. Thank God. Right? He does not wait until you get your act together. He loves you first, and that is the defining identity of being a Christian, the love of Jesus Christ. He's patient with us all. He doesn't want anybody to perish, just like his Father. So when you read those words in the Scripture that God doesn't want anybody to perish, Jesus doesn't want anybody to perish. He totally reflects his Father. He seeks the wandering one. He sticks with the Peters of the world. How many of you are Peter? I'll admit it. I'm the only one in here I know, but I'll admit it. Peter, the one who is always running ahead. Being loved is a wonderful thing. Can you get that picture that I'm trying to paint? I don't know if I'm doing a good job or not, but because sometimes it's hard to feel loved. 
especially by God, but that is the picture that we need to understand that we're starting from. We relish being loved by Jesus. And you relish being loved by others too, don't you? Aren't there certain people like when a little kid runs up and hugs you and you're like, oh man, this is the greatest, especially if it's a grandchild, right? And, uh, or your little neighbor who comes over. So, when we are loved, there's a response. There's a response. There's something that we need to do. There's action that proceeds out of love. He can love me all day long, and I can just walk by and not even respond, can't I? But I won't get the benefit of that love if I do that. And so what we do is set a new motivation. We set a new precedence in our lives of responding to that love. We make a determination, this person loves me, I'm going to treat him really well. I'm going to build a relationship. And so the new motivation is to put him in place as teacher and Lord of our lives and conform to his lifestyle. That's what the authentic Christian does. That's core, that's center. We resolve to make Jesus Lord. Because we know that foundation that he has for us is for our good. He's our teacher. He just finished saying in the last two weeks on Sunday morning here at First Presbyterian Church at 1030, he just finished saying, love your enemies. He just finished saying, do good. He just finished saying, pray. He said, forgive. He said, don't condemn, don't judge, right? Did you all hear that? If you didn't, you can go online and watch it. He said all those things. He's still saying them. And those are the do's and don'ts. And he, and he said, if you do that, give, you'll be blessed. If you forgive, you'll be forgiven. You won't be judged. If you don't judge, you won't be judged. There were a lot of do's and don'ts that they were, were good, good. Now, today, he says, why? Why to do that? So that's what we're going to read today. It's in Luke chapter 6. And we're going through little by little because we need to know all these steps. So here we go. Then Jesus gave the following illustration. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained, grab a hold of those words, will become like the teacher. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs never grow on thorn bushes nor grapes on bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Now, Jesus wasn't just speaking to that crowd there that was listening to him. That's kind of the sermon on the plain that Luke talks about. He wasn't just speaking to them, but he's speaking to us in 2022. Let's consider 2022 in America, and let's take these words as if he's speaking directly to us, which he is. And he says, can a blind person lead a blind man? He could have been talking about physical blindness. Do you think he was? No, he is probably giving an illustration about more than that. 
trying to help us think. The question is, can you become mature without subjecting yourself to the teacher? Can a first grader teach a first grader? There's no teacher. Is that a yes? <laughs> no. Can a, for, you know, how, how deep will your education go? As an English major, if I learn to read, that's good. That's a goal. But then if you don't interpret what you're reading in a deeper level, because some English teacher has taught you to do that, you're not growing. You're not growing. So now it's easier to, to look at other people, isn't it, than submit yourself to the teacher ends up school. So Jesus says, watch out. Watch out for that. Jesus calls for a certain lifestyle. He lives a particular worldview, and that is to he lives in obedience to God. That's number one. He lives by faith, and he lives by virtue. He has standards that he lives by. He lives by doing good to others. So love God, obey God, build in yourself standards and virtues, and then do good to others. That's how he lives. It's 2022. We all know how divided our nation is. We all know there are different worldviews. So what is the tendency? Well, I'm going to focus on that guy that I don't like, and I don't like his philosophy instead of focusing on me, right? Right? So if we focus on the faults of others, but we don't focus on any time on the scriptures, then we're not going to build into ourselves even discernment for what we're believing. So Jesus says, if you do that, you're going to fall in a ditch. Now actually, you know, a ditch, you, you think, oh well, I can crawl up out of the ditch, no big deal. But the word really was cistern. You're going to fall into a cistern. And a cistern's really deep. My grandmother had a cistern. We didn't have running water in East Texas in a, her house when we went to visit. It was a well, and you took a bucket and went down in that very deep well, and it was very dark down there. If you fell into that thing, I don't think it'd be that easy to get out. And so that's what he's saying. And so Jesus says your primary influencer as a Christian is his word, and you want to submit yourself to it. You cannot go wrong because he has authority. Jesus' words are the words of the king of kings. He has words that are heavenly, not just here. He can not only lead you, but he heals you as you read and study. He heals. You don't only just work hard, but he restores your losses because there are losses in this world. And so when you do read, then you learn that. You learn to trust that. He can restore the losses. He can help you see it as good news, what you're learning. He can exchange your mourning and your grief. And after the last two years, don't we need that? Restoration. Restoration. There's been so much grief in the last two years. He can recover those things that you've been diminished, that have been diminished for you. Sometimes that's physical. Sometimes it's mental. Sometimes, I mean, just all kinds of things. Loss of anything. He can recover. So be careful who you follow. Be careful where the focus of your life is. Earthly wisdom is not enough. Jesus offers you heavenly wisdom from the Lord of heaven and earth. Forget that other guy sitting beside you. It's not about him. It's about you. Now, how many of you had a child who did something wrong? Or know a child who did something wrong? And the child feels guilty. Now, what's it? guilty child's favorite thing to blame his brother and I'm telling you he goes to the parent and tells something on his brother so he can relieve his guilt right and, and the brother gets in trouble somehow that makes him feel less guilty for instance let's say you have a large glass bowl of chocolate in the living room 
delicious chocolate. In our house, that would be C's chocolate. You might like Godiva or something else, or Hershey's. But let's imagine that it's full of delicious chocolate, and your children know it's there, and they have to do something to get permission to have a piece of chocolate, like eat their supper, or their vegetables, or clean their dishes, or whatever your rule is. And so permission is granted only when they do that thing. However, they know it's there. You know, that's almost impossible for some children to follow. And so, one child sneaks in. He thinks one piece. Nobody will know, and he's, he grabs that piece of chocolate, and he runs outside, and he eats it. But you know, there's something about chocolate that draws you back. <laughs> so he just can't stop, and he does it a second time. And then after the fourth time, you know, he's noticing that the chocolate's going down, and somebody might miss that chocolate that's, you know, the jar was this, and now it's this. And, and so in the meantime, Brother T goes in. I have experience with this. I just want y'all to know. So Brother T goes in, and he gets a piece of chocolate. He probably saw Brother 1, so he decided he could do it too. And he sneaks a piece of chocolate and eats it. But Brother 1 saw Brother 2 do this because he wants to go in and get a fifth piece. And so he finds mom, and with contempt, utter contempt, he says, Billy just ate the chocolate all up. And so, of course, he's standing there oblivious to the fact that he's standing in front of his mother with a ring of chocolate around his <laughs> mouth. And then the other one, of course, has, you know, a little chocolate on his fingers and now there's only one piece of chocolate left in the bowl. Jesus' message is quite clear. You must begin with your own life. You only have control over yourself. Brother one's responsible for only himself. Brother two is responsible for himself. And so we must gain that life-giving, freedom-building, healing relationship with the Lord for ourselves, going to him, not worrying about little Billy and his spiritual condition, but seeking for ourselves. You have the Holy Spirit. And you may think, okay, if I read that Bible, I can't understand it anyway. But you have that Holy Spirit. So, think about, do an assessment of yourself. Can you turn off the TV? Can you turn off the computer? Can you lay the phone down for one hour a day? One hour, just one hour. You know, most of us are on it like 23 hours a day. We're on something. What if we just laid it down one hour and ask the Holy Spirit consistently? We read it with an open mind and with questions and say, Train my mind, Lord. Train my mind. Is it worth it? Because I tell you, you'll begin to be able to assess all the things that you hear in the culture if you do that. And you'll begin to live into his words. It's a growth process. It does not, it's not like the Holy Spirit comes on in. I'm great now. I'm not going to have any more struggles. No, it's not like that. It's growth step by step. Learning and understanding the Lord. It's like a good thing to think of is use, you use weed killers to kill all the addictions, all the bad stuff, all the stubborn weeds in your life. And then you use fertilizer, the word, fertilizer, to help your understanding flourish, to help you grasp what it means to be healed, the big picture healing of letting go of a lot of past pain and letting go of a lot of past mistakes and 
and being able to live into that wonderful heavenly vision. So when you get stressed out by the worldviews around you, can you stop and let that be your trigger to assess yourself? Can you stop and maybe pick up your scripture? And if you don't want to pick it up in a physical book, you know what? There's Bible apps that will read it to you. And they're great. Because godly wisdom will give you stability. It will. It will ground you. And a lot of that stress and anxiety we feel will be diminished. It will be diminished. So let's pray this prayer. Lord, open thou mine eyes, and I shall see. Incline my heart. Is that right? Incline my heart, and I shall desire you. We just sang it. Order my steps, Lord, and I shall walk in the ways of thy commandments. O Holy Spirit. O oh, Holy Spirit, be thou to me a God, and beside thee let none other, let there be none else, no other, no one else but thee. Amen.